brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Welcome to the Badminton Podcast. I'm Jeff. And I'm Henry. And we're the co-founders of Volantware, and we're here because we love badminton. Thanks for joining us. We're so excited to be here with the next episode of our podcast. If you want to find out more about what our podcast is about and why we started, please listen to our introduction episode. Today we're here to chat to Henry, my co-host, who's sitting actually right beside me. Henry's a proud badminton player who represented South Australia as a junior and at the Australian University Games for Melbourne University. Outside of badminton, he is a registered veterinary surgeon who has recently ventured into customer development and supply chain management in the fast-moving consumer goods space. He also assisted in the development of an Uber for Vets service called Vets On Call. And he is my co-host of the Badminton Podcast and co-founder of Volantware. More importantly though, he is one of my dear friends. Henry, thanks for being on this episode and also being the guest and the co-host of this particular show. No problems, Jeff. I'm looking forward to it. So Henry, we're just going to start off with one of the questions that we usually do ask all of our guests on this podcast. And that is, when did you start playing badminton and how did you actually get started? I actually didn't really know what badminton was until I was about 15 to 16. The reason for that is because I grew up in South Australia, Adelaide, for those of you who don't know. It is a a big country town, is probably what I would describe it like. And unlike Melbourne, it just didn't have as much participation in badminton over there. I spent most of my childhood playing various different sports, like soccer, basketball, tennis, swimming... I spent a lot of time playing tennis for most of my childhood, so until I was about 15 to 16, until one of my really good friends, his his name's also Jeff, but a different Jeff, um, he introduced me to badminton, and I fell in love. It was an incredible sport, and it's one of the few sports that I have continued to play to this day. So, I was 15 to 16, to answer your question, is, is when did I start playing badminton, but After my friend Jeff introduced me to the sport, we had quite a number of sessions where I was learning the sport, and we actually got into the competitive space very quickly. So I moved into playing a schools tournament for the first time at around 16 years of age, and that's when I was actually introduced to this world of badminton, because at that point in time, I hadn't really been playing badminton to the way that it should have been played. I was a tennis player, playing badminton. So when I entered my first school's tournament, that's when I met one of my best friends now. Her name's Leanne. She was a very, very good badminton player at the time. And it was my first connection to what professional badminton was. At the time, she was probably the best female under 17s player in Australia. And I realized what real badminton was and aspired to be as good as her and hopefully better one day. Hopefully I'm I'm able to at least spar with her these days, although I haven't played with her for a very long time. Great. And because you've been playing for, well, it's been almost 15 years now. So you're just drawing on the 30 year mark at the moment, which is exciting for you. I've already reached that 30 year mark. So it's something to look forward to. I'm I'm excited about it. (laughs) (laughs) Very much so, Jeff. (laughs) I'm sure. Yeah. Everyone's excited to turn 30, right? Yeah. (laughs) So you've so been playing for 15 years. You played a lot of tennis beforehand. What do you feel has kept you in the sport of badminton compared to tennis? So I know that you play tennis socially a little bit now, and we usually play sometimes during the Australian Open season when the weather's really nice here. But what kept you going with badminton compared to tennis? There was just something very different about badminton compared to tennis. When I was playing tennis, I felt that All I was doing was trying to hit the shot as hard as possible. And I kind of felt like I hit a bit of a wall. And despite all the training that I put in, I wasn't really getting much better. But when I moved to badminton, I found that I was constantly learning. And I'm still learning, even though I'm coming up to my 15th anniversary of badminton. 
it's still a sport that I continue to learn. And I've also learned a few things, you know, even in, even in the last year that I've applied to my game that has made me a better player. So I keep playing because I feel like there's still so much to learn and there's so many things I could do better on court. And it's not just about the sport, right? When you go and play sports, regardless of whether it's badminton, tennis, footy, assuming a lot of the times you go there to play the sport, yes, but you also go there for the community. You go there for your friends. You go there and just have a really good experience that, that doesn't just involve what's on the court, but what's around it as well. And what I really love about badminton is that you can build some really great friendships and you actually look forward to the time you spend together, not just on the court, but off of the court as well. I play a lot of social badminton um, in Melbourne and you you might be working during the day and you're just holding out for that game of badminton at the end of the day. Yeah, I think a lot of people will resonate with that, Henry, in terms of why they actually play. So the, for the sport itself, of course, but for the people that you meet, the people that you hang out with. And there's just so much community involvement in badminton itself other than just playing if it weren't for badminton i would have never met you henry and it's also because of leanne chu our mutual friend and also because of melbourne university badminton when we played in uni games teams together as well so i think that's the same with everyone who plays everyone's got these connections that they've made that are really really special and i believe that your current relationship you met her through badminton as well that's correct jeff I think there's there's lifelong friendships you can make in the sport and certainly for me personally I have you know met met my partner Renee through badminton we actually met at a social session and I think that's something really there's something really beautiful in a way about that that you would meet on common common grounds common interests and you just have this level of respect for each other after something like that so Henry just recapping on your badminton story so far you picked it up when you were 15, 16, you played tennis previous to that. And one of our friends, Jeff, he introduced you to the sport of badminton. And since then, you've met so many people, you've improved, you've really found that it is your sport and something you want to be playing for a very, very long time yet. And here we are today. Because I know you personally, I do know the story behind tennis and badminton and the story that you usually tell when someone asks you why you actually play badminton. And I I'd love for the people listening to just to hear what you've got to say about that because it's really powerful. In terms of my story and what I went through in high school, because badminton was my predominant sport, when I started representing the state and the country in the junior level, I would be recognized by my peers at school as the badminton guy or someone who plays badminton. And they knew that I played for my state and my country, but they could never really truly appreciate what that actually meant how much training I was doing, how good the sport was, and how badminton players really are, how good the athletes are, how powerful they are, how strong, how fit, how skillful. But if you compare that to, say, if I was playing cricket or tennis or Australian football, if I was to play for one of the well-known teams, even if it wasn't at state or national level, I would get a lot more recognition for it. And that's also because people know about those sports more in a country such as Australia. And I know that you've got a similar story as to tennis and badminton. Would you like to share that? Yeah, I will. I think, you know, when you use the word appreciate, that's really important to me. And it was really important to me when I was younger as well. So growing up in Adelaide, as I said, it's, it wasn't, badminton wasn't a heavily participated sport. It wasn't a dominant sport. And just like, if you think about Australia and badminton in Australia, it, it's not a very popular sport. You're sitting at 150, 160,000 participants in Australia compared to, you know, the 220 million in the world and some of the even more popular countries like China, Denmark, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, etc. What I found when I was growing up was that, to be completely honest, I felt a little bit, a bit self-conscious about talking about badminton as my primary sport when I switched from tennis to badminton. Because in Australia, tennis is, is such a, a top shelf sport. It, it, in Australia, you, you know, there's, there's a few key sports that Australians love and that's okay. They love footy, they love tennis, they love swimming, they love cricket. There, there's, there's a few key sports, but badminton is, is, it's not a top shelf sport like the rest. So when I went to school, I was playing tennis for the most part before I was introduced to badminton. Being a tennis guy, as far as social, the social setting was, was concerned, it was absolutely fine. 
when I was 15 to 16 and I found my my passion for, for badminton and my love for the sport and started to develop in, in that sport and basically put tennis aside, put tennis more as a social thing for me and focus on badminton and getting better at badminton, I actually found it very difficult to tell my peers that I played the sport. And that's through no fault of theirs. It's, it's my, my own fault and my own self-consciousness at the time. I was almost embarrassed to say that I played badminton because the responses that I would get when I said I play badminton was, oh, okay, you play badminton, I that play, sport. I played that once in school. Yeah, I played, I played that once in school. I remember, I know that sport. I played it at picnic once. And it's just not badminton, right? For, for those of you listening, you know what badminton is. And, and maybe, maybe you don't. And maybe that's, that's why we're doing this podcast, to share with everyone what the sport truly is about. And how you go go about playing and getting better at it. But for me, yeah, it was it was quite a challenging time that transition for me. Even though I loved the sport, I was so uncomfortable with sharing that with my peers. So now I'm just all in. I'm all in for badminton, and I want to share that with everyone. I think it's a great sport, and it just doesn't get the recognition that it deserves. I'm not saying that we should be here defending the sport and saying that it's better than any other sport. It's more about sharing the incredible sport that it is and especially the camaraderie and the community built around it as well which I really do love. Henry it sounds like badminton has taught you to openly express what you really love doing and what you're passionate about rather than them being too concerned with what other people think of you and the sport that you play and I think that's a really important lesson for me as well that I'm making sure that I live true to myself rather than doing what's expected of me or what's meant to be better. Other than that, what would you say you have learned the most from badminton? Have you been able to apply that into your life? Yeah, look, following on from that, I feel that badminton has helped me chase after what I'm truly passionate about and what I do enjoy in life, whether that be personally or professionally. I feel that it's given me the confidence to essentially not so mu- not worry so much about the consequences of my actions obviously take calculated risks uh, as necessary but the way the badminton has taught me as a person and professionally is that life is short and you should really go for what you want you should express yourself how you should how you want to express yourself and not fall for the social pressures that might be mounting around you in addition to that Badminton has taught me discipline, taught me how to achieve results, because when I did switch from tennis to badminton, the, this learn, the learning curve was steep. I really wanted to play in the under-17s state tournaments and play, play for South Australia, but I had about six to 12 months to learn the sport and get good enough to get into the state team. And without the culture of discipline that badminton had taught me I wouldn't have gotten there and following that following that on to my professional career everything that I have gone towards I've gone towards with that same attitude that I can achieve it as long as I put in the work and that has led me to where I am personally as well as professionally now that's really interesting Henry Thanks for sharing that story with us. It is really important to see where, you come, where you're where you coming from and the steps and the pr- progress that you've made throughout your life in badminton and how it's affected the rest of your life as well. Switching gears a little bit now into your professional life. So we went to university together. We weren't in the same course, but both of our courses were five years long at the University of Melbourne. Mine was dentistry. Yours was veterinary science. And five years of studying, and then you went to work as a vet. How did everything turn out after graduation for you? What was your story after you got that certificate, you stood up in front of the stage, your parents are proud that you became a vet, you had a doctor in front of your name, and what was the story from then? How did you end up now kind of not working clinically anymore, but looking at developing yourself in the business sense as well as personally? That's a big question, Jeff. <laughs> I've got to be completely honest with you. I will start with, I guess, my parents' expectations of me, because I think that's really important. My parents didn't really give me the typical, st- well, the stereotypical Asian expectations, right? Be a doctor, be a lawyer, be an accountant. 
you know, aim for the, the high salary jobs, right? And it's funny because people might think that veterinary medicine or being a veterinarian is, is a high salary job when in, in fact it's not. But I'll, t- I'll talk to that point in, in a bit as well. So I got my, my letters, I suppose, after, after university, my five-year degree. And what university really taught me was how to learn. I didn't really take away, I, t- I took away the information in the course so that I could become a, a veterinarian. But what I really took away from uni was the ability to actually learn and look things up when I wasn't sure, because that's what really got me to where I am today. But yeah, once I finished university in 2013, I worked in Adelaide, South Australia, back back in my home because my dog Chester was there and he was he was about 15 when I moved back to Adelaide and I started working at one of the general practices in Adelaide, it's a, a group of practices under the banner, the Adelaide Animal Hospitals. So I worked there for about two years and unfortunately towards the end of my time there, I lost my dog Chester. And the story goes that he had developed a lung tumour, unfortunately, and the pathologist who we were actually in very good relations with told me over the phone the pathology results. So the results taken from his chest were conclusive for a lung tumour. And that sort of put a bit of a pause on, on my life and I decided I didn't really want to be in Adelaide anymore. It was very hard for me to be in Adelaide knowing that I'd be working for the practice that my dog had basically been diagnosed in. So I decided that I needed a change and I needed to move back to Melbourne where I did my university degree. Henry, would you say that the reason that you started studying vet and you wanted to be a veterinarian, was that because you loved animals? I know that it was also because you really wanted to take care of Chester as well. But I think a lot of people out there who potentially are applying for their university courses, my perception is a lot of people apply for it because they really love animals they want to work with animals but speaking to you and knowing you for such a long time being a vet isn't just about playing with the animals in the hospital or in the vet clinic there's a lot more to it that may may actually take away from that that feeling that you do get when you play with animals yeah jeff i think there's a lot of myths and truths about the veterinary profession that i'll hopefully be able to shed some light on in this podcast as well. I think a lot of people, and and to go back to your question, yes, I I do love animals. I really do love animals. And it's hard to love every animal that comes in as when you're working in the veterinary profession. And I I mean that, and I mean that in the most sincere way, you know, I, I love animals, but can I truly love each and every one of the patients that come into my consult? I think it'd be very challenging emotionally and it was challenging emotionally when especially when you do spend a lot of time with a particular case that you know unfortunately is is going to end badly but you do unfortunately you do tie yourself emotionally too as well people often think that being a veterinarian is cuddling puppies and kittens every day (laughs) it's not unfortunately it might be coming into work earlier than most people and your first consult is a euthanasia a selfless act from the pet owners that concludes in about 30 minutes. And then I'd have to move from one room to another to vaccinate a new puppy. The emotional exhaustion that vets get from that kind of activity in the practice leads to a significant challenge when it comes to maintaining mental health. And look, that might sound really sad. And I don't I don't mean to make it sound sad. I think If you love animals and you want to work with animals, you want to serve animals with your life, then being a veterinarian is a very fulfilling career. It really just depends on on who you are as a person and whether that, yeah, whether that actually fulfills you. For me, it didn't, but that doesn't mean that if you want to be a veterinarian, that that won't fulfill you either. This is my experience and my experience only. So if you do, if you do want to become a veterinarian, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you if you'd like to know more. And I think that's really important, Henry, in terms of why you get into the profession is yes, that you do love animals, but no, it's not just about cuddling nice, cute puppies every day. I've seen you come back when I see you and you've got scratches all over your arms. You've, I think you said one of the dogs just latched onto your 
underneath your arm, I think, your lats, like the side of your body, and just I was just hanging there. They couldn't get it off for a little while, and you had big bite marks in there. So yeah. not saying that it's a, a bad profession, just a, a few little truths about it in that some patients can be a bit tricky to manage. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, and then not just all the loving puppies that we do love to play with all the time. Yeah, but what's what's interesting about that particular story is that I had no idea that it was it was a boxer, a big boxer, about 40, 50 kilos. I had no idea that it was going to latch on. I was just walking around in the hospital and I turned my back and all of a sudden I had been bitten in the back. It was very quick though. And I look back at it and, and laugh now, uh, but it was, it was a challenging experience back then. So Henry, the story goes, you've graduated with a degree in veterinary science, Bachelor of Veterinary Science, and then you've gone back to Adelaide, which is where you grew up. You took care of Chester and then you worked full time, more than full time, many hours that you were doing. And then you've decided after everything you've been through, you wanted to come back to Melbourne, you wanted to get out of Adelaide. And then I do know that you worked at a vet in Melbourne for a little while as well. And then there was a period of time where you've decided that you wanted to do something else. What did you do? Well, yeah, Jeff, when I came back to Melbourne, I worked in a small animal practice, a couple of small animal practices in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. I had a significant life event occur that, again, similar to my loss of Chester in Adelaide, that really put a pause on what I was doing. And I realized that being a veterinarian wasn't what I enjoyed. So I actually moved into the pet nutrition space, still being able to utilize my veterinary science degree and expertise, but I actually moved into customer development or sales. So I worked in the field. And what that means is that I was a territory manager managing veterinary clinics, hospitals, and pet stores, teaching them about the value of nutrition for animals and how we can use nutrition to transform lives, how we can use it to manage certain types of diseases like kidney disease, liver disease, and various other diseases as well that you can actually manage. That was the transition for me last year, and I've learned a lot since then. It might seem a bit strange to go from clinical practice and suddenly jump into customer development or sales, but it was still an area that I was confident in and I had the expertise in, so I was more than happy to make that transition. And beyond that now, I've actually moved on to a new role, which has actually nothing to do with veterinary medicine. I'm currently working in supply chain management. I guess the simple way of describing supply chain management is basically how do you move a box from A to B and all the, and all the things that are involved around that and certainly learning a lot from that now as well. So I bet a lot of the audience and people listening would have questions as to, well, you studied for five years, you become a doctor or a veterinary doctor, and then you've worked a bit, but then you've decided, hey, I'm going to put a stop on this and move into sales and then now into supply chain management, which is completely different. What would you say to someone if they were struggling to find something they were passionate about, even though they spent five years, six years more studying something and the feeling of potentially, oh, I'm giving up something I worked really hard for. How do you get them over that barrier? What do you say to them? Is there something that you just like to say to them just so that they can feel more secure in their decision or just the feeling itself? And it's okay to have this feeling. You don't have to stay in the same industry because it's happening everywhere. Us millennials, we are very privileged in what the opportunities that we actually have, unlike our parents who had to work the same job for 30, 40, 50 years without questioning and without complaining because that was what they needed to do to support us and to live their lives. But now we're in the day and age where a lot of people are having different careers. Even if they studied something, they're moving into something else. So for someone who's having a bit of fear or they're a bit worried about making that transition or just a step. What would you say to them in terms of them trying to see if they want to follow their passion? Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of elements to that. The first thing is actually knowing what their passion is. I think for most people, there is this recurrent theme in their life that maybe they don't know yet, but when they actually take a step back and have a look at where they started, where they've got to, and everything in between, you kind of realize what's important to you. For me personally, that was growth and change. It comes naturally to me to be able to just adapt to something different. And that might be a trait that all millennials have. I feel like we're the, the generation of the jacks of all trades. 
and that's okay. If, if you if you are a jack of all trade, I think that's absolutely fine. But equally, if you are someone who is more than happy doing what you currently do, then keep doing it. I've had a couple of conversations with people that tell me that what they're currently doing is not what they want to do. And the question I generally ask them is, what's stopping you? Because what's life going to look like if you don't do what you want to do? It might sound really simple, but so many people just settle for settle for getting by, setting, set, settling for being comfortable, even though they're, they're basically working for the weekend. And that's not the kind of life that I want to live in. I'm sure that's not the life that most people want to live out there. So if you are one of those people who are scared, concerned about jumping into something completely different, being uncomfortable, but I think it's important to be uncomfortable sometimes because that, that really stretches you to grow as a person and to really find out what you're passionate about and to be able to live a life that when when you look back at, at the end of your life, unfortunately, you know, our mortality is, is, is inevitable. And I, I really don't want to take this into a sad spot in this podcast, but, you know, I think of life as a, a series of photographs and, and you end up with an album at the end that you get a few milliseconds to, to have a look through. I think it's important that you're taking the right photographs. Henry, this is a topic that I'm probably just going to jump in here because it's something that I hold really close to my heart as well and I have opinions about. So forgive me for hijacking this this show a little bit. No, that's but okay. When you were talking just before, I was thinking of three things. The first thing that I was thinking of was when you talked about making a decision and that difficulty in making it, being worried and everything like that. What I wanted to just say about that is the decision only takes a split second. The decision is instant, basically. You can make a decision and that's it, it's done. It's all the, the process of getting yourself prepared for the decision. That's where the stress, that's where the anxiety, that's where all the time takes. I'm not saying you need to jump into anything without considering the risks, the benefits, etc. But a lot of the times people will put a decision off because it seems too hard or too long or too far away. And it's not. A decision is a decision. You can make it right now. I can decide not to eat fried chicken right now or to decide right now to eat fried chicken. And it's a split second. It's as simple as that. It's just that we make it a lot more difficult and a lot more stressful because of all the other thoughts that happen. The second thing that I just wanted to add to what you said, Henry, is that if you are in a profession, and I'll use you as an example, if you are in a profession or you've studied something in a certain field and you're thinking about moving out of that field, there are baby steps you can take along the way. You don't need to jump out straight away and go into something completely different, although many people do and they have great results. But if you're like me and you're a little bit more conservative and you just want to make sure you're covering all bases, what you did, Henry, where you were a vet, you knew about pet nutrition already because of your profession, and then you moved into the pet nutrition space, which is a completely different role, but it anchored and it leveraged your knowledge that you already had. So for someone wanting to take the next step, Potentially that's looking for a different role in the same industry that you already know. And then it's not such a big step and it's no, not so scary because you already know what you're doing. It's just a bit of a different role and then you can grow from there like you did, Henry. And now you're not in bed at all. But without that little step, maybe you wouldn't have had the opportunity to be in supply chain management right now. The third point is something you touched on about passion and knowing what your passion is. This is a question that I ask myself a lot and a lot of people do. And don't be embarrassed or don't feel bad if you ask yourself the question, hey, what's my true passion? And you don't actually know because a lot of people don't know. And to this day, my passion's always changing. And that's a real key point I want to outline is that people think that your passion set in stone. Once you decided your passion, that's it. You have to be your passion and you can't change it. That's who you are straight up for the rest of your life. And I don't think that's true at all. Your passion as a three-year-old to get that toy is completely different to your passion right now. So there's no reason why your passion can't change and there's no reason why you can't try things to find it. A really good analogy that I heard, I think it was last year, was that finding your passion is like falling in love. When you first meet someone, you don't fall in love with them straight away or generally speaking, you don't, okay? When you find a new passion, you're not going to love it straight away. It's the continuous doing of it. It's the interaction with the person or the thing that you're passionate about, it's the process and then you decide, hey, this is what I'm really passionate about or hey, I'm really in love with this person and it's not something you need to know straight away. So what I heard previously, which was really helpful was it's kind of like going on a date. If you go on your first date, do you expect to fall in love with them the very first time? It's ridiculous to think that. Who would fall in love? With... Maybe there's someone out there who'd fall in love in the first date, but 
not many people probably would say that they'd fall in love just at the first date. Just like a passion. If you think something's your passion and you want to try it out and you do it once and you think, I don't love this, it doesn't mean it's not your passion. It just means that maybe you need some more time with it because you can't really decide in one date with your passion. So yeah, sorry to hijack there, Henry. Just a bit of a, a few tips that I came up with when you were talking and those things are really close to my heart as well. Yeah, I think for the those who are listening, those additional points are really important. And it, I think it's really important, as you highlighted there, Jeff, that if, if you are a conservative person, if you're if you're a bit different to me, I'm a bit more of a risk taker. Jeff is, I, I would say, a, a bit more conservative than myself. And you'll know yourself best. Spend a bit of time with yourself. Yeah, forget the YouTube for a bit. Forget the Netflix and chill for a bit. Just spend a bit of time in determining you know, how, how you are as a person and what suits you best if you are going to make a transition like that. So for me, I was lucky. I'll call myself very lucky. I'm very grateful that I got the opportunity to transition to a role that I had expertise in and it was a bit of a small step. If I had my time again and, and the supply chain management role was the first thing, maybe I would have done that, but I don't know. I don't know. The truth is I don't know. And for you out there, if if you are scared, you know, if you're scared and you're a conservative, then take a conservative approach to it. You can still take risks, but you can take calculated risks because you are still going towards your passion. And as, as Jeff said, you might not know what your passion is. And, and that's something that you just have to test and try. But if you don't test and try, if you just listen to this podcast and take no action, do nothing and, and listen to this podcast just to feel good then you're not going to get anywhere. What are, what we really want from you from this podcast is is to actually chase your dreams, whatever it might be. Just take the next step. You don't have to quit your job tomorrow. You just have to look online for a new job in an area you're interested in. You just need to find a book at the library or online that you're, something you're interested in, something you want to learn about. You just need to get that book and start reading it. It can be as simple as that. You can do literally anything to change where you're going to be but everything every long journey starts with one single step and the step doesn't have to be huge yeah and as jeff said you know get a book learn something new it doesn't even have to be a book right everyone learns differently you could listen to a podcast you can listen to an audio book you can watch a video whatever it might be whatever you're interested in there is a source out there for you to get more information and find out whether that's truly something that you want to pursue and don't be scared of making the wrong choice. And wrong doesn't mean wrong. It just means you know another thing that you're not really passionate about. So if you make a choice and think, oh, why did I choose that? I'm actually not interested in that, in that at all. Awesome. That is a win. That's not a loss. That's a win because you know, hey, I'm not going to try that again. I already know that I didn't really like that. And imagine you, like Henry said, at the end of your life where you're looking through your photo album and you look at the photo where you tried something and it didn't quite work out, you can go, hey, look, at least I tried that. I didn't just settle for what I had and I took a step forward and I took a step back. That's okay. And then take another step forward in a different direction. I think the main thing here, as is your passion, Henry, is just growth and development. So Henry, we've been at this for a little while now. And usually what happens at the end or concluding a podcast is that I'd ask you as the guest, what are three take-home pieces of advice, information, or actions you'd recommend for someone listening? But I'm going to steal the show a little bit. I'm going to steal one of those points and give you two. I hope that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the take-home action that I'd like to share with you is around finding what that passion is. Because if I ask you right now, hey, what's your passion? And you honestly don't know. That's awesome. We can find it. There are ways to try to find it. And I'm going to take you through one of those right now. What it involves is every single day. It has to be every day. It has to be repetitive. Every single day for the next 30 days, at the end of the day, just before you go to bed, just grab a journal, grab a book, grab a piece of paper, write it on your computer. I don't care. But ask yourself these three questions. And when you ask yourself you write down the answer. You don't just think about it. You actually write it down or you type it on your computer or tablet or whatever you're using. The first question is, what filled me with energy today? What filled you with energy? Write down everything on that day that filled you with energy. The second question, what drained you of energy today? What's something that really drained you that just made the life come out of life? we really didn't enjoy. And the last question, what did I learn about myself 
today. What did you learn? Did you learn that you're impatient? Did you learn that you're patient? Did you learn that you're good with money? Did you learn that you spend too much? Etc. So just little things here and there. But the importance of the 30 days consecutive is huge. If you just do this once every so often, the answers you're going to get and the realizations you're going to have are going to be far less than if you do it consecutively. And you'll probably get to a stage at day 15 where you think, there's nothing good about this. Nothing's coming out. I don't know what I'm actually doing. It's a waste of time. But on day 16, you might have something that hits you. On day 17, on day 18, the important part is consistency here. So that's my one take-home tip for finding what your passion is. Jeff, that's really powerful. And I guess my tip following on from that, it's a great, great second tip, to be honest. I feel myself, um, if I can say so myself, <laughs> because it actually follows on from that. So maybe you've reached that 16th day and you've decided what it is that, that you're really passionate about or you think you're really passionate about. My second tip is to take that second step. It doesn't have to be a big lofty step. It may just be looking at more information about that thing you're passionate or potentially passionate about. It's that simple. It could be as simple as looking for a looking for a new role in the area that you're passionate about. It could be as simple as buying a book or borrowing a book about what you think you're passionate about. Or even looking online at a tutorial. Something something like that. It doesn't have to you don't have to take much time. Just a small step in the direction that you really want to head in. So that would be my my second tip or our second tip for today. And with that, the third step would be to surround yourself with like-minded people. It's really important to surround yourself with people that are going to push you. If you do find what you're passionate about or what you think you're passionate about, tell someone. Let someone know that that's something that you're going for. Let someone know that you're trying to pursue something, something that means a lot to you. And maybe other people around you won't get on the bus with you. Maybe they want they want you to be at their level. Unfortunately, some people are like that and they tell you, oh, you should just be comfortable. Why are you going for something unrealistic? That'll never work. Exactly. <laughs> but it's important to surround yourself with the people that, that are going to cheer you on. Obviously, be realistic and tell you, okay, that's definitely not going to work if it is unrealistic, but most of the time you'll find that those that are supportive, those are the ones that you want to be around you, the ones that also have their own goals, that also have their own dreams, their own passions, things that they're going about as well, because they can go with you on that journey. You don't have to be alone. There are so many people out there that might be thinking exactly the same way that you are. They might be feeling scared. They might be intimidated with what's out there. But if you find someone else who's feeling exactly the same way, you can both, or even in a group of five or 10, you can tackle it together. Love those two other tips, Henry. And I just want to reiterate the importance of finding that group of people that's going to push you along the way and basically grow. You can grow together as a group. So Henry, this has been a pretty deep podcast, to be absolutely honest. We ventured into why you started playing badminton the kind of embarrassment or shame, if I may use that word, that you had around telling your peers that you were a badminton player, not a tennis player anymore. And then we moved on to vet, which is a great profession. We do know that a lot of vets out there are very fulfilled, and we also know the opposite as well. So the insights there about vet, and if there's anyone out there that's looking at doing vet, I would strongly, strongly, strongly consider you to get in contact with Henry just for a bit of a discussion. He's not there to change your mind and say, don't do it but he will give you a lot of really invaluable advice. And then we jumped into the really deep parts about your passion, about taking the next step and really going after what you really want to do and that the next step doesn't have to be a huge leap. It can just be a a micro step just in the right direction. So based on this podcast, I know that there's probably going to be a lot of questions and the good news is Henry, both Henry and I, are open for anyone to contact us if they want any que- if they have any questions they want answered or any advice. So finally, Henry, thanks for being the guest on this podcast and also the host. Thanks, Jeff. I really enjoyed it. Actually, we kind of got really deep there, and we did. We did. And we just went completely off our plan. We just blurted yes. everything out we, that was on our we, minds. We went. We went rogue. 
But uh, I, I think hopefully, hopefully the audience will enjoy this one. So as always, thanks again for tuning in to the Badminton Podcast. We're going to continue to push you to grow, both as a person and also we want you to grow as a badminton player as well. Make sure that you keep sharing your love of the sport with everyone that you know so that we can truly show the world how incredible badminton is. If you want to connect with us, you can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube via our social media handle, Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R, and on our website, www.volantware.com. This podcast was brought to you by Volantware the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.